Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Golia Mary, President of the Center for Global Engagement, which seeks to enhance America's standing in the world by strengthening our engagement with international audiences. Golia is former Undersecretary for Humanitarian Values and Diplomacy at the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, as well as Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs. She has generously agreed to share some of her insights with us. I'd like to thank you, Goli, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So you are at a very interesting stage of this organization. It's new in formation, and you and your board have decided to form the organization out of some uh, academic work that has been done, um, as well as public policy work that has been done. So describe a bit your board and describe how you have reached the conclusion that such an organization was critically needed at this juncture. Thank you very much, Mark, for the opportunity. Uh, you know, since 9-11, uh, there's been, I would say, over 24 different studies on both sides of the aisle that have uh, suggested and recommended the establishment of an organization outside of the U.S. government that could take advantage and leverage the ingenuity and the innovativeness of the private sector to strengthen America's global engagement and to inform, to better inform, um, engage, and influence foreign audiences, a practice known as public diplomacy. So finally, in 2010, the Woodrow Wilson Center um, convened a bipartisan working group of 80 top-notch experts and thought leaders um, in the field, both from the public and the private sectors, to operationalize this organization. And you know, the, the phases of, of establishing and operationalizing this, an organization is, you know, you need to put together a business plan, you need to get the organization established, raise the funds, put together your initiatives and your projects and your products, and then um, recruit your people and, and you're in business. So these 80 people came together under the auspices of the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, with honorary co-chairs, secretaries um, Condoleezza Rice and um, Bill Perry, and um, uh, generously funded by the MacArthur Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And this group of people contributed their time because of their passion and their interest, all on a voluntary basis and developed a business plan for the organization, which was launched at the Wilson Center um, in March of 2012. And the backgrounds of these uh, 80 people, uh, describe um, how, they, how they clustered, how their experiences informed this work. So, you know, they came from the private sector, from the high-tech industry, from the venture capital industry, from um, uh, the entertainment industry, just from the rest of the business sector, as well as from academia, from the think tank community, and former government officials. We also had a group of advisory members that came from the U.S. Congress, from the Department of Defense. Um, I think we even had one person in an advisory role from the State Department. And all worked together in five different committees um, to develop this business plan. And this was a, wasn't a matter of some sort of partisan perspective or lens through which um, this initiative was, was being uh, built. There was a real intention to include all voices of interest for international engagement. Absolutely. That's 100 percent correct. Um, you know, because when we're talking about America's global engagement, we're not talking about you know, partisan global engagement. We're talking about... The Republican about, Party's global, or the, exactly. or the Democratic Party, or whatever party's global. It's, it's really the, the American nation's exactly. global engagement. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, the, the, the mission of this organization is to foster um, global engagement with a view towards um, promoting shared values and common interests, increasing mutual understanding and respect, and enhancing America's standing in the world. So it was very, very important for this to be a bipartisan initiative. And, you know, the studies that I mentioned really come from both sides of the aisle. I mean, this recommendation is something that Republicans and Democrats both have been promoting for quite some time. Now, is this about imprinting American values on other cultures, or is this about true 
global engagement, bi-directional uh, global engagement? Really bi-directional global engagement. And I think when you, when you look at the mission statement, it's really about promoting shared values and common interests and increasing mutual understanding and respect. And I think the group truly felt that, you know, if, if we're able to better inform and engage foreign audiences, they will have a better understanding of what the United States and its ideals are all about. And, you know, oftentimes we may talk about American ideals, but, you know, these are really universal values and common values that, that we're talking about and thinking about. Although it, it includes uh, people from different areas, it's not an initiative that is captivated by any one area. It includes representatives of civic society. It includes representatives from diverse business uh, sectors and communities. It includes uh, nonprofit leaders, academics, uh, people who come out of government. Uh, but it is not an organization that seems designed to be captured by, by some agenda other than the agenda of the common agenda of engagement and communication. The, the beauty of the situation was that we really wanted to bring experts to the table, people that truly understood what it means to engage global audiences. How, what does it mean to market an idea? How, how can we better use technology? Because, you know, when you look at the objectives of the organization, you know, the first objective is finding innovative ways of creating ties between Americans and the rest of the world. Right. The second objective is, you know, leveraging technology to um, uh, do better public diplomacy. So, you know, what we're really focused on right now is um, using mass scale outreach mediums, which, you know, when you really think mm -hmm. about it, it revolves around media and, and entertainment. Right and uh, mobile and internet technologies to be able to better engage foreign audiences. Now, are we moving in, in a sense beyond um, sort of unitary focused interactions where governments and government officials um, take the primary role? Uh, and just as in the technology space or in the business space, we're finding that new, more dispersed uh, business organizations that work on partnership basis and, and subcontractual basis and shared service basis are becoming much more successful. Um, are we also seeing that in terms of, of public engagement in which it's not government to government anymore? It's people to people and people to people on, on a lot of different levels, uh, whether it's art, whether it's these types of, of engagement. Is, is this part of that, that trend? I really think it is. I absolutely think it is. You know, the, the, the U.S. government or any other government for that matter, you know, plays its own role in public diplomacy and that's in promoting, you know, U.S. policy. And there's also some suspicion of, of government to government uh, interactions as well. So while they can play a role in certain areas, there can be some barriers where people say, oh, it's the government, or it's the U.S. government, right. or it's the Iranian government, or it's the Chinese government, and you can already start to hear all the different things on either side that create barriers. In a sense, you're trying for engagement that, that um, finesses those barriers. Exactly, it really, and, and gets over those barriers, and really takes advantage of the and I'm going to use this word again, you know, the ingenuity of the private sector, the entrepreneurial spirit of the private sector to find ways of better engaging foreign audiences. I mean, we're all completely aware of, you know, the impact of Facebook and Twitter on, for example, what happened with the, with the Arab Spring. Sure. And, you know, we need to better leverage these technologies to be able to reach audiences in a, you know, in a more productive, efficient way. And, and you're also thinking beyond conventional, um, the, the fact that entertainers are part of this, the idea that, that how the message is given and, and making it interesting and fun, but also multidimensional so that you have the various interests represented. So if people want, are more interested in the business impacts of these connections, that's great. If it's more academically, that's great. If it's more just about the, the fun part of learning about other cultures, uh, that's also part of, uh, of what you're doing. I mean, it's a very serious endeavor, but even very serious endeavors can, can, be, uh, can be provided with a, with a good sense of humor. You know, the, 
the point of, of, of CG is to really reach mass audiences. And, you know, you have to find the best and the most efficient way of being able to reach these audiences and talk to them and um, start a dialogue. And, you know, oftentimes one way of doing that is through the entertainment and, 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 and you know, broadcast media. And if you can find a way of promoting shared values and common interests through the entertainment medium, then you clearly have reached um, large audiences. In fact, you know, there's, uh, there's a study that's been done by uh, Professor Schiappa of the University of Minnesota, and he's currently on, um, at, at MIT, about the impact of television on changing attitudes. And, you know, um, the, the, the theory, the hypothesis, um, is that, you know, oftentimes people don't distinguish between people who they know in person and people who they meet through television. And television has been known to impact attitude. So if we can take advantage of that, of um, better engaging with foreign audiences and finding a way for them to get to know America and Americans better, then I think we've accomplished our mission. There's also a tendency today to self-select into narrower and narrower um, points of information. As opposed to being exposed to broad information, you have most famously the, the Fox uh, MSNBC divisions here in this country where people are just looking at one side of a political dialogue or another side. That is also taking place internationally so that there are truths that are being, or quote truths, uh, that are being disseminated where you have um, nations in conflict, cultures in conflict, just provide, talking about their one truth. Is there an approach that you wish to uh, take that um, actually invert that? We're very focused on this promoting of shared values and common interests. Because I think everybody who was engaged in, in the uh, Wilson Center Public Diplomacy Initiative and in creating this business plan and in establishing this organization um, is very keen on this idea of promoting shared values so, and common So what interest. are those shared, shared values? So, you know, interest? shared values are, uh, you know, equal rights, um, human rights, um, women's empowerment. Um, respect. Respect, exactly. Um, the importance of freedom of speech. So these go back know, to, tolerance. to many of the, uh, of the values that are, um, that are incorpor incorporated in, in the UN Charter. Exactly. As well. So exactly. that they're not owned by any one nation. Exactly. They, they came from the, the traditions of many different nations. Exactly. Do you find that that in and, its, in and of itself is controversial? One hears um, the controversy, for example, with the recent um, uh, vote about the uh, disability provisions in the, U in the UN um, sponsored initiative where we couldn't get a treaty uh, signed despite the advocacy of uh, across the board of uh, people like uh, uh, Bob Dole and, um, and uh, Kerry and so on. Do you find that, that uh, your initiative is viewed in certain areas with, with a modicum of suspicion? <laughs> well, we haven't really come across that uh, yet, and I certainly hope that, you know, we'll continue on the path that, that we've been on. You know, I, I really think that when, when you look at the mission of this organization and you see that it really is all about promoting these shared values and increasing mutual understanding and, and respect, um, you know, I think we'll be able to accomplish our objectives if we really remain focused on, on the mission. So you, you have this group, you have the study. Um, what are your next steps? Actually, since the organization has been established, we've really um, hit the ground running. You know, we are um, putting together our board of directors, our advisory uh, council, which is really very important because mm -hmm. these are the people that you know, can help us get to the next step. We're um, putting funding proposals together. We're working on producing a TV series that will run in our pilot countries, which will be of interest, but at the same time it will promote um, certain shared uh, values. We're working through the details on that one. The other project that we're working on is an online global collaboration platform where to begin with, Americans will offer their skills and services uh, pro bono on this site to audiences in the four 
pilot countries of uh, Turkey, Russia, Egypt, and uh, and Pakistan. And we know that you know volunteerism and philanthropy is is th that is really a very um, I would say robust American value, and we know that Americans um, are very keen in volunteering their, their their time and efforts. So we're working on establishing this global platform to be able to give them the opportunity to actually provide services of value to other countries. And we know that two of the items that are of great interest, one is um, the promotion of entrepreneurialism, is you know working with people, uh, mentoring people in other countries on you know how do you start a business and how do you get over some of the hurdles. And the second one is teaching English. You know, we know that um, there is two billion people right now all over the world that are trying to learn English, and there is another billion who actually want to learn, but they don't have the means. So if we can provide that on a pro, pro bono basis um, on this global platform, I think it really will make a difference. And learning English is not just about learning English. It really is one of the most powerful economic empowerment tools because people who know English can find jobs. It's and lingua franca. Exactly. And studies have shown that that really economically impacts seven people in their immediate surrounding. So in terms of putting together your board and your advisory council, have you, have you gotten to the point where you know when your board will actually be in formation or, or be completed, and then you'll be moving into the, um, to the, to the uh, part where you're hiring staff? Our objective is to uh, start hiring staff in the first quarter of 2013, and um, we are shooting for the latter part of the third quarter of 2013 to have our full board together, which will be uh, comprised of 15 individuals, mainly from the private sector, because we really want to make sure that we keep the private sector aspect of this organization. We want the Center for Global Engagement to be run like a high-tech startup, you know, efficient, productive, lean, and very, and very productive with immediate um, results. And, you know, we are based in Los Angeles, and that was mm -hmm. a decision that was sort of made um, on purpose. You know, we, we wanted this to be um, in a location that would not be too involved with political issues, mm -hmm. but at the same time be close to the media and entertainment industries and be close to Silicon Valley so that we could take advantage of um, the high tech. You're industry. also filling a gap. It's a strategic decision in that Washington is a very crowded place for such organizations. Um, the West Coast is not a crowded place, although when you look at it in terms of geographies, um, you have kind of an equidistant effect between um, the, the, um, the South American countries who are emerging um, the Asian countries and the European countries mm -hmm. um, uh, all across the globe. So in, in many respects, it's a, it's a very, very logical um, uh, place to be. That's an excellent point, yeah. In terms of, of uh, your program and as you, as you shape your, your uh, various programs, are you going to focus initially on these two initiatives, the, um, the TV uh, series in, in pilot countries as well as the uh, online global collaboration uh, function? Right. And, you know, those um, are fully aligned with our first two objectives, which is, um, you know, the application of new technologies for public diplomacy and creating innovative ways of um, promoting innovative ways of creating ties between Americans. and. Uh, people in other countries. You know, our three other objectives are promoting free media in developing countries and promoting moderate voices to counter um, violent extremism and then creating public-private uh, partnerships. So we will be working on those three other objectives as we go on in 2013 and we bring the appropriate staff on board to be able to deal with, um, with these other initiatives. But these two are really clearly the ones that are, we're focused on at the beginning, and um, you know they require a lot of um, focus, time, and, and, and effort. And we want to make sure that you know we we remain focused to be able to implement them. Do you properly. see yourself working directly with people on the ground, or do you see yourself working through organizations 
uh, in these different countries? Because right now our focus is on um, mass outreach, and we want to go through the mediums of media and entertainment and internet and mobile, you know, I think right now our goal, our objective is to reach as many people as we possibly can. Now, if working with organizations on the ground will facilitate this process, then by all means we will work with organizations uh, on the ground. Um, we will also work with organizations in the United States that can help us bring people, for example, to the online um, global collaboration platform. You know, if we're going to promote entrepreneurialism, if we're going to um, provide English teaching on this site, you know, we need to be working with organizations that are experts at this and can um, offer this as a service to their members. That you know, if you're interested in volunteering, this is the place that you can you can go and provide your services to people in these um, other countries. Well, if you take a look at, at online uh, facilities, organizations like Volunteer Match are providing this ability to connect uh, people who have a desire and resources, time, sometimes money, with organizations that require that type of help. A lot of times uh, in, in various countries, there is a monopoly um, often exercised or sometimes exercised by people who are not moderate, who have a political agenda, but provide um, help to communities um, with a little bit of a string attached. The string, the string attached is that it comes with a radical idea of, of how society should function. Um, when you start to provide the connection between people who would wish to help and people who need help, without that intermediate control, you, you suddenly shift the dynamic within, uh, within society. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very interesting idea to, um, to create an organization that is unconventional in the sense that it, that it will leverage technology that people can tap into directly um, right. and, and shape the way they would wish it to be shaped. Exactly. And, and we really, we, we do think that this is a, this is a unique um, concept. And, you know, I really want to emphasize the fact that, uh, you know, this, our goal is, is to create the tie. So it's not like one entity is the teacher and the other entity is the learner. I think that right. teaching and the learning is, is, you know, is going... It's symmetrical, well, it's right? Symmetrical. I mean, the, the learner becomes the, teaching, the, the, the teacher and the teacher becomes the learner. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we really want to emphasize the, the, the bi-directional uh, nature of this. But, you know, I think when you, when you look at what the high-tech industry has been able to accomplish, you know, they have created these ties. They have created, through the technology, the technologies that they've been able to offer the world, they've been, they have provided these ties. Now, it's our job to take these technologies and to make sure that we create those ties between Americans and people in the rest of the world so that we can promote common values and enhance America's standing. Now, will you also seek funding that is multidimensional as well as you move forward? Absolutely. You know, we're, we are obviously a startup and we're very open to um, working with a large number of organizations. You know, what we've learned is that um, Clearly, there's an interest on the part of traditional foundations. There's interest on the part of um, smaller family foundations um, from high net worth individuals. We know that the corporations are interested when you talk to them about discrete um, projects that, you know, sort of tie into their corporate social responsibility um, objectives. And, you know, I think um, if we provide a product of value, we think that this organization even has the potential of receiving international funding because we are focused on promoting these shared values. That's so important because it actually uh, breaks some of the, the traditional models and it creates a more balanced um, approach and a more balanced thinking in terms of, of how to use technology and, and other uh, means uh, to interconnect. Uh, part of your success is going to be how much ownership people in other nations feel for your concept. And by giving them the opportunity to invest in that concept, um, you actually heighten ownership. I think it's a very clever 
um, very uh, astute way of approaching this, as opposed to the easier, more conventional way of, of finding uh, conventional funding located in Washington, D.C., um, creating your, your networks conventionally uh, along K Street and so on. Uh, you're, you're taking the, the uh, perhaps more challenging, but, but perhaps also more fruitful approach. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. I think we're going to ask you to join our advisory board. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the whole idea really behind CGE is that it needs to be entrepreneurial, and it really needs to be able to think outside of the box. Well, this has been just wonderful. Golia Mary, thank you so much for your work for this uh, organization, and we'll check in later as, you, uh, as it unfolds. And thank you so much for your insights. And Mark, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I really want to take this opportunity to thank the amazing 80 individuals that spent so much time and energy on this project, and over half of which are still engaged and involved. Don't we have a great society where uh, volunteering and, um, and nonprofit approaches uh, deliver so much value? Exactly. Thank, thank you. you.